Hey, Bella. Hello. Hi. I was I was just mentioning you're the most like prompt guest ever on Chocolate. Or am I? <laughs> I've been sitting here since like four in the morning, all nervous. Oh yeah. Well, that's okay. That's not as bad as sitting there. I was thinking four in the morning, but that's seven in the morning here. So. <laughs> yeah. But you know, my my thing has maybe more to do with my son, who is three, who has these weird sleeping habits right now. He just wakes me up. 10 times a day. I'm tortured at home. So this is nice. This is a, this is a nice retreat for me to sit here and talk to you. I don't know. The people around me would tell you that I'm probably not much better than a three or a four year old. So really, <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask you questions about mommy. What's your favorite? What's your favorite? Anyway, what's my favorite? I don't know. I, I, that seems like a question that a three year old would ask. Like, what's your favorite? You know, I would say wine. <laughs> right now it's wine. Got it. Hey, so the other thing is about this, not only were you on time and prompt, which I'm appreciative of, you're the first real guest that like had your marketing team reach out to us and ask the, to be on the show. So thank you for uh, being that yeah. person too. You know, I mean, I, I like you said, I, this is all new to me too, because I, I am not a big social media person. I'm, I'm a little shy when it comes to that. So I had to hire somebody to actually post and, you know, say something. And that person was, you know, like the, the person that I hired suggested, why don't we reach out to people that do live Instagrams because we fit right in, right? We are chocolate makers here. And I'm like, okay, this might be a little uncomfortable. Why not? Let's do it. So I did one a couple of days ago, my first Instagram live. And it was nerve wracking because I don't even know how to log on. <laughs> so, so this I'm, is I'm my second. I'm not your first, I'm your second. That kind of hurts my feelings, you, Bella. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry. I, I just needed to do a test run. I didn't want to embarrass anybody. Who'd you talk to? Who, like, would, was it just like some random person on the internet or did you like talk to somebody, you know? About yeah, some, you know, I picked some random people. <laughs> I need some friends. No, I mean, I, again, this was my marketing team. So I had my marketing guy interview me basically and, and talk okay. about how, you know, we shifted the business through, you know, how we basically made it through the pandemic. That's what we Got talked it. about. Got it. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But yep. you, you were all worried about, because I didn't give you like a list of questions. You're like, what are we going to talk about? I'm like, we're going to talk about chocolate. I don't know what we're going to talk about. We're going to find out. That's the beauty of this program. It's all sort of free flow. Um, I love that. But anyway, That's so good to know. Dalman, Dalman, the name Dalman, in regards to pastry and confection, has a long history. Right. I mean, like, right. there's Sorry. more than there's more than just this chocolate shop in San Diego in regards to your family. Right. Right. So, yeah. My grandfather. So I'm originally from Austria. I came here 20 years ago and my grandfather started a pastry shop in, in Austria in a little village right outside of Salzburg where Sound of Music was shot. So he came from Germany, from the northern part of Germany. He was a trained pastry chef after the war, he just, you know, fell in love with the place. How can you not? Pr pretty much probably anybody that watches here has probably seen Sound of Music, especially in the U.S. And he just wanted to settle foot there. And he built a pastry shop that became successful because the region where I'm from became so touristic after the movie was shot and also because of Mozart's uh, inheritance there. So uh, my parents took the business over later on and turned it into a pastry paradise. So I was born and raised with ice cream and chocolates and cakes and lots of tourists and and this is really uh, where I came from. So I had lots of friends as a kid because everybody always wanted to come home after school with me because they knew that we had, you know, all the sweets in the world. It was it was fun growing up as a child. But then later on it became a little bit of a curse because my parents made us work in this business constantly, right? So my brother became a pastry chef and he was back at the house with my with my dad and all the other trained pastry people. And then I was front of the house with my mom and the server serving, you know, tourists coffee. And it was not something that I really wanted to do. I wanted to, to just jump in the lake or go skiing in the winter time. And I, you know, it was a family business. We had to do that. So to be honest, I never in a million years thought that I was going to become a, a, a chocolatier because I wanted something else for my life. I didn't want to take over the family business. I grew up with Beverly Hills 90210 and MacGyver and, you know, Night Rider, all these cool shows that are filmed here in California. So to me, I kind of wanted to go explore the world. So my parents said, why don't you 
go to school and study and your brother is going to become a pastry chef and take the business over. And that's exactly what happened. So I went to school. I studied hotel and restaurant management and I ended up in the US in San Diego because I got a job here uh, in a hotel doing like a, you know, a management training program, going through certain divisions of the hotel. And I did this for a good 18 months and I got, you know, bored with the position and also to be honest, a little frustrated with it because at the beginning when I landed in San Diego, and started this position, you know, every, the hotel had 300 rooms and every other check-in or check-out would say, you have an accent, where are you from? And it made me feel so special. I'm like, ooh, you wanna know where I'm from? Let me tell you. But after the 10,000th time of telling, I'm like, ugh, I don't wanna have an accent anymore and I don't wanna check people in and out anymore because I, I don't wanna tell my story anymore. So I asked to be transferred into, there was a little gourmet store on the side and they had like European products, right? That they bought from Europe, like little chocolate bars and this and that. And it was like perfect for me because I felt right home. And I got a phone call while I was working my shift from a company that's based in San Diego. They're called mainly Mozart, you know, the composer Mozart, the nonprofit I've organization. You have, okay. Yeah, so Mozart, we were going to sell it. We, we, we were going to celebrate Mozart's 250th birthday. I think it was like in 2004 or something like that. So they called me and they knew that there were a bunch of Austrian people working in the hotel and they asked me if I would know where they could buy the specific chocolate that we have in Austria called a Mozartkugel. And I was like, yeah, my parents make those chocolates. How about that? And this is how this whole chocolate thing started. You know, this is where I was like, wow, this, is, this could be amazing. This could be, you know, bringing the family traditions over here to the US. This is really where my wheels started turning about keeping this family tradition alive. And this is when I started making chocolate. This is really when I got my hands for the first time on chocolate. I grew up in a pastry shop, but I had never baked a cake before in my life. So it, I was constantly around it and I saw it, but it was not something, you know, you know, you know how it's different in Europe. You, you go to school, you get trained, and then you, you, know, you, you, you make your route to become a professional. And I went a different path in my life. So to me, that wasn't something that was ever really pre present like that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It, so, it makes it, it makes a ton of sense. I mean, I think that, you know, we've talked with some, you know, we, we, we spent some time with um, Susan Notter. I'm glad my brain can't function today. You know, a couple months back and, you know, I think I come from a, a lineage of working with a lot of Europeans and, and that process is totally different, right? Like, yeah. you know, at 15, you're in, in that trade right? And, and welcome to pastry. That's now your, that's, that's now you, exactly. Yeah. And you know, I'm going to have to say too, I had a really hard time at the beginning of it. My family thought more or less that this was a little bit of a joke, right? It's more, it's like this American dream come true from the dishwasher to a millionaire story. Not that I am anywhere close to that, but I woke up one day and decided to become a chocolatier, right? So it was a little bit of a slap in the face for my dad who had been I, that's what I'm saying. Not that he ever spoke up, but you know, now thinking back, it must be annoying to have to go to school and to train and learn specific techniques and then have it so simple kind of, right? right. In the US where we can just do whatever we really want. You wake up one day and you can do whatever you want here, which is great. Okay, but so you've decided you want to do this chocolate thing. Like, yep. But there's one thing about making a decision and there's another thing about going out and starting that process, right? I mean, <laughs> like, so, but before we get to that, I just, I gotta ask, like, Knight Rider, really? Like, David Hasselhoff, is that, like, are you, like, are you falling into that cliche, like, the whole German, <laughs> Austrian, like, we love David Hasselhoff and Baywatch, or, you know? You know, I mean, I feel like there's this whole reputation about him here in the U.S. You know, he had one song that was big in Europe, and my, you know, I was, you know, six, seven years old, right, when the show was came out. So, and I had an older brother who watched that show. So just like, you know, with my kids, the little ones follow everything that the bigger one does. And that's exactly what I did. So, you know, Night Rider, yeah, he was a cool dude to me. And the car, you know, it could talk. It seemed very, you know, at I, this point, cool. I feel like... I, we... like you're cool. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying you played right into that European, German, Austrian stereotype about David Hasselhoff. Like... It, it was very cool. You know, that's cool. Yeah. You know, we, we only, at this point, I feel like we only had like three channels on TV. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Don't, don't judge me because I, uh, I, you know, I, I even had a book, like, um, my parents, they came to the, they did a, a, a whole 
U.S. vacation once for two weeks when I was around that age, and they came back with like a book about David Hasselhoff. And I think that I still might have that at home in Austria. I have to look. <laughs> All right, the trivia question today, what was the car's name? Oh, Kit. All right, cool. Then you win. Okay, then you're not just making it up. So we're good. <laughs> okay, so we're now back to chocolate. So you, I mean, okay, so I actually had to, I had to Google. I Googled the, the Mozart Google. Oh, you did? Oh my gosh, good job. Yes. So great. Good job. I know how to use Google on my phone. So you did, so these other Austrians want you to find a Mozart Kugel and you've decided that I can open a chocolate business in the United States. Was it that simple or was, I mean, is that, was it, was that kind of how it went down? No, well, the idea was that simple. I mean, this is, this is how I na naive I was too. So I was, how old was I? 22, 23 years old when I started, you know, when I thought, okay, let's become a chocolatier. And so the, the fact that we were celebrating Mozart's birth year and he's so, the classical music Mozart is so big where I am from. And I felt like if there's only a fraction of that here in the US, if there's only a fraction of people celebrating Mozart and, you know, there couldn't be possibly any Austrian, other Austrian here in the US making this chocolate, I just saw a niche where I could maybe fit in and make the chocolate and supply it to, you know, who knows how many people, 10, 15, 100, 1,000. I, I just didn't know what could come out of it. And I quit my job from one day to the next. And, you know, my, we had already bought an apartment, so we had a mortgage running. But, you know, I thought we were going to make it. I, I'm going to make it. I'm going to buy myself a villa next to, you know, next to David Hasselhoff. <laughs> the following year because I thought, you know, this is, this is going to work out. So I flew home. My dad gave me a crash course in chocolate making. And again, at that point, I thought because, you know, the reputation that I knew about the U.S. was we don't have, you know, the U.S. doesn't have quality ingredients. Everything is mass manufactured and used with cheap ingredients. And Europe, you know, France, Switzerland, they have all the good ingredients. So I thought my biggest problem was going to be to find chocolate, right? So I came back here, I noticed that it was very easy to find good quality chocolate, quite frankly, the same kind of chocolate, right? I bought myself the mold and, you know, I, I bought myself some books and took some crash courses. And then I thought, I'm, I'm ready to sell these chocolates. But unfortunately, the guy that was initially interested in buying the Mozart Kugels in bulk, he was laid off. And mainly Mozart went, you know, you've done your research, you noticed that there's a mass manufactured version of that chocolate and then still a handmade chocolate, right? A handmade Mozart Kugel. So I was making the handmade version with the good quality ingredients, which is expensive. But then there's also the mass manufacturing companies that just do exactly, you know, they use the, the crappy uh, ingredients and they just sell it cheap. And this is what they went for. So my bubble burst a little bit about, you know, making it to Beverly Hills the following year. But I have to tell you, when I flew home and I stepped foot into my father's kitchen for the first time voluntarily, right? Because I, I had to work in the business. But I flew home and I voluntarily actually stepped my foot into the kitchen, which I had never done before. And when I saw the chocolate, you know, the blocks, the Calibau blocks, that's what they used. When he, like, he, he melted this down for me. And for the first time, I actually... My, my senses awoke, or is this English awoke? You know, woke up, basically. I saw the aroma, the, the aroma that filled the room. And, you know, all this stuff that I had been around all of my childhood, all of a sudden was like, wow, this is, this is so cool. And then the ingredients that you can put inside of the chocolate and the art that you can put on top of the chocolate, all of it made total sense to me. So, you know, it, it was really that moment where I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I want to I wanna learn more about it. So I flew back to the U.S. My, like I said, my bubble of, of big, making it big with that motor Kugel, it wasn't that easy to answer your question now. I didn't have a business, right? I had, I had a dream and I had a, a, an idea, but I definitely had to, you know, jump around like a bunny to really make this a business and make something out of it. So you now have, you're, you're in San Diego, because we had to yep. talk about that. And you know, I think you now have two locations, right? Well, with the pandemic, we closed everything. So okay. we, we, because there wasn't, you know, I, we knew that this, we were not going to survive it. You know, as soon as the pandemic hit, I was, I made the decision to let's close the retail stores um, and just focus on what has, you know, I kind of cleaned up a little because stuff was already not working really. The store never really was, we, it was never really generating profit for us. It was more a marketing tool, right? You never knew who was going to walk in. 
And, you know, the corporate orders came out of it. Sometimes press would walk in and they would write something about us. But it was never really making money. And the fact that I am not physically there, we have the production somewhere else. It was sometimes a little bit of a hassle, you know, when employees call in sick and I live 40 minutes away and I have three little kids at home, I would have to drive all the way downtown to close the store down at nine o'clock, sometimes bring the kids with me. It, it, it was just, so I cleaned up. I took this as an opportunity. Let's get rid of the stuff that doesn't work and let's try to pivot a little bit into the 21st century. You know, let's, let's shift and work on, on, on the website and that kind of stuff. And that's, that's what I did. So most of your chocolate sales sold that way, both both website and, and wholesale, right? Website and wholesale, yes. And we, I mean, we do have in our kitchen, we, even though it's not made for retail, but we do have a lot of people that come in. And most of them are confused because when you walk in here, you're literally in our production facility. And they're like, oh, what is this place? And, you know, they enjoy it because they can see a little bit behind the scenes. So people come up here too. I feel like I was in a place that was like on a second floor in an outdoor facility. It was really pretty. Which, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, I feel like I visited adult. My store? Yeah. Yeah. The store, both of them. I mean, it was hard to let them go because they're kind of like babies, you know? They, it, it, you, it's so much sweat and tears goes into opening up something, whatever business that is. So any closure is, it, 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 it wasn't easy. But, right. you know, I mean, I'm telling you, if I wouldn't have closed the store down, I don't know if we would have survived it. You know, the, the rent that you pay, and when landlords are not necessarily open to working with you because they're kind of in the same dilemma, what are you going to do? Your hands are tied. Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked with a lot of people in the last year. I mean, this program came out of COVID. Like, what am I going to do yeah. every day? You know, I mean, was right. honestly, like, I better fill some time with something or else my people around me are going to say, you don't do anything. Um, yeah. But I mean, so we've spent a lot of time talking about COVID and the changes that COVID has forced in sort of that, that business environment. But, right. you know, I, it, it was about making hard choices for everybody. You know, oh, whether, absolutely. That's, whether that's having to lay off, a, lay off a, a valued employee or close a retail location or spend a lot of money on fixing a website. Yeah. You know, those are just three things that happened to everybody, I think, in the last year. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, sometimes... Sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my mind around how lucky I've really been. You know, I mean, all, to be honest, all of my life. But if you look at the path that I've taken with chocolate too, I started, you know, 16 years ago, let's say, whatever. I don't even know when I started this business because at the beginning it wasn't really a business. It was just, let's see where we go. But at that point, I had a, a handful of other friends that also started a business, most of them in the restaurant industry, right, or wine shops. Even my husband had a restaurant. All of them along the, their route or their path, all of them have gone out of business. And some of them even went to school, right? They wrote business plans. They had exact ideas on what they wanted to do. And none of them have survived. And here I was, really, I didn't have a plan. I didn't even know how to make chocolates. I didn't really know anything about this industry. And I somehow managed to survive. And even and through this pandemic again, at least, you know, I had a product, you know, chocolate is, we have products that we can sell online. We can ship it out. And on top of that, it's a product that makes people feel good, right? So during this pandemic, when everybody hunkered down and, you know, some people had some disposable income still, let's send out a box of chocolates. I mean, our online sales went off the roof. We came out on the other end twice as strong as we were before. And it's, it, this blows my mind at times still. And I, I, I have a little guilt feeling in me. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I mean, and that's something that I think other people that we've talked to, you know, I think I heard, I heard at some point in the middle of all this that, that we were all in the same storm. We weren't all on the same ship, right? Like you hear that expression, we're all in the same boat. We yeah, were yeah. all in the same boat. We were all in totally. different boats, but yeah. we were all in the same storm. And you know, I, I don't know why, I mean, I, I guess I understand why people needed chocolate in the last year and a half, right? I mean, I, I need chocolate all the time. Um, it makes me feel better. But I mean, I, I don't know why chocolate weathered the storm as well as it did, um, you know, better than a lot of other hospitality or retail industries did, right? Right. Um, and that, and that's, a testament to, I think, the product, but I think it's also a testament to what we do with the product, right? So, you know, obviously you're making product that people like, right? And, yeah. and it was still accessible. But, I mean, what, 
I guess the question then is, what is your role now at Dolman? I mean, are you are you in charge of innovation? Are you in charge of everything? Are you in charge of the kitchen? Like, what what became this role out of out of the last year and a half? You know, so I have to tell you, growing up with a working with a family that has a business, my my parents weren't really role models to me in the sense of business people. They were working. Oh, they were the first ones to come and the last ones to go. They were working, working, working. There was never one day of a vacation. So I, I grew up with that mentality, right, to work, not to just to work, to come in, show up first and leave last. And that was a little bit my biggest problem because I didn't really work on the business. I constantly worked in it. And I still have that guilt when I sit down and I actually have a bunch of stuff to do. I'm like, oh, I should do, you know, I should help package or I should help make chocolates. So I've taken this last year to work on the business. I mean, I kind of had to, because if, if I had to let everybody go, first of all. So it was me. And then, you know, how, how do I shift this around? How do I, how do I recover the income that we need to survive? Because, you know, me and my family, we live out this. So I, I sat down. I, you know, applied for all these loans. I got all, all kinds of money and I invested it into figuring out a plan, right? What am I going to do? So I built a brand new website and I hired a market team, marketing team. And that was the best thing that I could have done because they have created um, a, a whole market. Like, you know how this goes, right? A calendar. So I am now doing what I actually like to do. I mean, I still like making chocolates, but I'm kind of shifting away from the passion of making chocolate, from the labor of it. I like to invent new product. I love the idea of business. You know, I take it to one level and then I want to take it to the next level. So I am I am now really trying to grow this business. That's what I've been doing for the past year to come up with things and see where, where, where do things work, where don't, don't things work, and let's shift, let's pivot along with that. So let's, let's talk about the innovation side, because that's like one of my favorite pieces of the conversation. Like, yeah. I mean, where do ideas come from? Like, where do new things, where do new things start for you, for Dalman? Like, how does it all begin? Well, it's, it started, how did it start? So, you know, I mean, we, we well, made it say, from... Like, let's, let's say you need to do a new recipe. Like, so, oh. like, let's just, I mean, I get... We need X. How? Do, where does X come from? Like, where does that 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 it, process? It really, from? it really all starts from people reaching out first of all and saying, "Hey, you know, do you have this? Do do you have that?" And then we hear it more and more often. So you know, it, it it's like you know, for example, the vegan stuff. We we just came up with a vegan collection. I am not a vegan, but I got I I get emails on a daily basis if we have anything vegan or sugar free or that kind of stuff. So. Uh, you know, I listen to what my customer base wants from me, and then and then I look into it, right? I start researching and looking at recipes, and start looking at to what would I want to eat? Because vegan to a non-vegan sounds over, you know, to me it, it sounds bland, and like how can we make it make it exciting? I hope that I'm not offending anybody here, but I, I always look how can we make put texture in it and flavor and make it fun and and something for for that audience. So then we go into recipe development and I usually involve the team in it. You know, we all play around a little bit and we get feedback from, you know, is this something that we like? And then we do a little test run and then it comes out. So it's, it's really as simple as that. There's, there's not, I am not a person that's very organized and structured. I just, something comes, you know, an opportunity comes my way where I feel like there's an opportunity and I give it a shot. And then I do everything from start to finish. And then we, put it into production. I teach everybody how to do it. And here we go. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense, but this is really how we roll here. It does. I mean, I think that there's, there's, there's different ways to skin a cat. I don't know if you're allowed, are you allowed to say that anymore? Are you allowed to say different ways to skin a cat? I mean, there, there's different ways to sort of run that, to, to put all those pieces together and run that business. Right. right. I think what, one of the things that I've learned in the last year is that there aren't as many as I thought there were. There's only like three or four ways to really put that all together and, and at least in the chocolate side, right? Um, you know, and I think there are, there, are, there are chocolatiers that are more receptive to what the world is asking for and then they figure that out 
And then there are chocolatiers that are more receptive to, I'm going to put out what I want to put out and you're going to like it. Right. Or I'm going to do right. such a great yeah. job that I'm going to do such a great job on it that you don't have a choice but to like it. And that doesn't always work yeah. either. Like there's, yeah. there's a little give and take on that too. Right. Um, Absolutely. I feel like, you know, I mean, for me, for, for the most part, you know, we built this business on wholesale, right? We dealt a lot with hotels and restaurants offering turn down amenities and check presenters and that kind of stuff. And it was a ball that started rolling and it kind of, you know, we, we made it to a certain level where I was financially comfortable. Let's put it that way. I was able to put the kids in school, pay, you know, payroll, all this stuff. But, you know, it, we went, we got into a standstill here and there wasn't really anything newly developing. So I am really, this is to totally new to me too, figuring out new products. And so it doesn't get boring, right? For the, for, for the, for, for the people that do follow you and are loyal to your company to come up with new stuff and see, Hey, is there something out there that you actually want that you want to see? And it, it helps me to be more open-minded and, and have fun. But there's got to be some stuff that you can't stray from, right? I mean, like, there, there's got to be some piece in the box or in the, that you do wholesale that people want to see all the time. Yeah. Right? I mean, what, what are some of those things that you can't give up that, or change? Um, you know, I mean, this whole thing, my first orders I really got because of one specific chocolate that I'm making, which is a sea salt caramel. I know it's boring and, like, it, it's, like, it's so... What is what is it the saying like last year's news? <laughs> I tend to old not hat. speak English very well at times. Still, you know, Your old English news basically. Great. <laughs> no, I come I mean, up I, with things sometimes. <laughs> but but so, no, I mean I don't I don't think you have I don't think not you but I don't think one puts together an assortment of products in confection and doesn't have a, a really good sea salt caramel, right? I mean that's well, that's just part of the gig. And to, to, to me, that was pretty much our bread maker. You know, this, this was the one chocolate that everybody wanted to, or all these hotels that we supplied, they wanted that sea salt caramel for a, a, a couple of reasons. First of all, it was well received, right? People loved it. But for me too, it was easy for me to sell it because caramels have a long shelf right, life, right? I don't right. have to worry in three weeks if they haven't sold it, are people, are the guests going to bite in something moldy? You know, I didn't have to worry about it. So obviously I pushed for the sea salt caramel a little bit more too, but this is, we probably made about 80% just that chocolate. Now, not so much anymore. Now, now it's all over the place. Now it has shifted to, you know, we have this feature on the website that people love where they can build their own box, they can select their own flavors. So now it's really more about, we have to make every single chocolate now, that, you know, we weren't used to that, making every single chocolate that we have in our inventory. Now on a daily basis, we have to come back in and make chocolate over and over again. It's kind of fun. It makes it, it makes work a little bit easier because before I would maybe get, you know, 10 online orders a month. And right. then here is somebody that wants, a bananas faster chocolate, but there's only one customer that wants that. I cannot just make one chocolate. So I have a whole ton of chocolate left over. What am I going to do with it? So, you know, this was like, this is the thing that I, I'm saying, this didn't work, right? For this business, it didn't work. It was an annoyance. And this is what I'm saying. We cleaned up, we shifted and we, you know, like, let's, let's see what, how we can make this work. And, and luckily it is. And now I don't know how New York is, but you know, we in California, we're completely open. We don't even have to wear masks anymore. Hotels are opening up, wholesale is coming back. So it's kind of nice because I feel like I have now, I have e-commerce, I have wholesale, I have corporate. It's kind of nice to have your eggs in all the baskets, you know, not just in one. Will there be a retail location again? Um, never say never. I mean, you know, never say never. I, I am, I have thoughts and plans, um, but I, I haven't really put my foot down on on what this is going to look like, but we do, you know, we are outgrowing our current facility where we are at. So we are looking into moving our kitchen into a bigger place and it would be nice to have a little retail in the front, some offices, manufacturing, you know, warehouse. My, my, you know, I know that I've made it once I need a forklift <laughs> and I'm there. I need a forklift. Hey, so I'm trying to integrate the questions that people are asking, but yeah. this one's like in German and I can't like, I, you don't even want me oh, to like try. The one right now? Yeah. So I have to tell you guys, 
Daniela, she is my oldest girlfriend from Austria. We were, um, she, she's one month older than I am. And we grew up together. So she, she okay. said, she, she's extremely proud of me because she's watching. She watched my other Instagram live and she knows that I have anxiety about this. So she logs on whenever I'm live and she gives me her thumbs up, my mental support. So she says, you, what do you, what, how do I translate this in English? She said, you, you get around quite a bit now, she said. Be careful with that expression. That could be something totally different <laughs> in English. Yeah, no. Oh, I said something again like that. Hey, whatever. <laughs> hey, so, you know, because we're on this innovation conversation and we're talking about where stuff comes from. What's something yeah. that you thought was going to be great and didn't work that you guys have done? Or that you took to the hotel and you're like, this is perfect. And they're like, yeah, what, Bella, what were you thinking? This is not good at all. Um, hmm. You know, I have one chocolate that comes to mind specifically that uh, wasn't, wasn't a big success with a few people. I mean, you know, I loved it, but I gave samples to a few people and they didn't like it. So I am a, a truffle fan and I'm talking about the earthy truffle, right? I love truffles, I love truffle oil. You know, I, I, want, my tr I want truffle oil on everything that I ate. So I thought, why don't we make a chocolate with truffle oil? And I made a, you know, a, a, delicious, exquisite white chocolate ganache. I'm going to put a little bit of truffle oil in it. And I gave this out at, on a, you know, I actually went to a, um, like a show. It, it was something local, you know, like one of these restaurant weeks thing where you have a booth and people come up and they eat it. And that didn't go down so well with most people there, which I was like, you just don't have the palate for it, you know. <laughs> so, I'm like, you just don't have the palate for truffle oil. You should go and, you know, go get a sneakers bar. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't really continue with that route, but I still liked it. What do you think of that? What, a truffle? I, you know, I think there are people that do it. Um, I think I love, I, you know, I'll truffle oil on a French fry. I actually, tr I, I sprinkle truffle salt on my, on my popcorn. Well, so, they, see? I, I'm a truffle guy, but it's got to be done right. Like if you, I think, and that, I think that's the hard, and I'm not saying it wasn't done right, but I think you're right. I think the hard part about um, um, innovation, right, and and creating a new product, it one is you got to get it right. Yeah. Right. And two is you got to get it to the right person. Right. Right. Like the people that watch this program know I've got like a Kit Kat bar problem. Like, I will eat my weight in Kit Kat bars, like, right now. Um, and so the people around here, when they travel and they see unusual Kit Kat bars other places in the world, bring them back to me, right? And the, um, the see, NCA... Somebody the wants NCA, truffle chocolate. See the comments? Everybody who said, I, truffle is a mushroom that grows underground. That's right. So a truffle oil is infused with it. Right. See, people like it. Sorry that they interrupt your story, but oh, maybe yeah. I should no, come back right. up with it. I, there are <laughs> other people that do it. But anyway, so one of, one of the people on my team was at the NCA All Candy Expo this week, and Hershey's giving out all these, like, new flavors of Kit Kat, and they give him the breakfast cereal Kit Kat bar, which tastes exactly like Fruit Loops, right? And I like a good Fruit Loop, and I like a Kit Kat bar but I didn't really care for the Fruit Loop flavored Kit Kat bar. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. But, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be successful with it. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't, it didn't taste right because it tasted exactly like a bowl of Fruit Loops. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I think that's the hard part about like this whole, ooh, truffle salt on the caramel. That might ooh. be the winner. See, honest. like people are going bananas about the truffle. Look at this. Right. Should I come up with a chocolate that has truffle oil in it. Let's see the answers. <laughs> I'll do, do it. I do like the truffle salt on the caramel. I, I think <laughs> that could work really, really well. Like, and if you don't do that one, I'm going to do it. But and <laughs> I, I think that's the hard part about innovation, right? Because like we have this idea in our head. Yeah. Right. And then we have to have it taste like the idea in our head. Right. And then we kind of have to hope that people like that flavor. Right, whatever that flavor is, whether yeah. it's truffle and you know, or I mean, ultimately, salty caramel. 
and there's always going to be people that you know like there's it's black and white people like it people don't like it right so you always who's i did once i did um a chocolate competition with a brewery here a local brewery most people know it's stone right They're here in san diego and their executive not the pastry chef but i think wait, maybe it was the pastry it was long time ago but we we went head to head on um we created chocolates and it was paired with um with beers so he came up with like this crazy chocolate. It was wasabi and tomato paste. To me, it sounded horrendous. To me, it was like, oh my gosh, I, I cannot imagine this being good. And, but who am I to say, right? Like, and I might not have liked it. I actually never really tried it because I was busy with my tasting. He was busy with his, but that's the point. And that's the beauty. This is what's so cool about chocolate making because I don't feel like there's a limit to it, right? Who am I to say that, uh, Filet mignon might not be good with a truffle for somebody. To me, it doesn't sound good. To me, that goes maybe a little bit too far. But I, I like that with chocolate, you can be so um, innovative. Yeah, and that, that coming from a European where everything's hazelnut and raspberry. Right? right? You know I mean, exactly what, yes. My, my grandfather, if he knew with, you know, some of the flavors that I've, I've, I've wondered what he would think about it, you know, like... We have like a coconut curry. I know this doesn't sound too crazy, but he was very traditional, like the good old brown right. chocolates. Yeah. No, I mean, so I used to work for Albert Reese Imports. Right? Yeah. And all of our chocolate was made by Lederach at the time, who's just, you know, a 150 year old Swiss company. Right. And we went to them and said, we want to do a line of truffles that are all spice flavored. And they said to us, no. And we were like, well, yeah. Why not? And yeah. like, well, then you're going to have to create all the recipes. And so we created the recipes and there was coconut curry, there was paprika, there was, I forget the other six, but they were, they were really against this idea. And this is 15 years ago too. So 15, 20 years ago, because it was so foreign at that time. And yeah. it was so against the sort of the mantra of Swiss chocolate, which was yeah. hazelnut. Right, their innovation was four new hazelnut flavors, right? I mean, <laughs> we're using crushed hazelnut this year as opposed to sliced hazelnuts. Oh, okay, cool. That sounds great. Maybe put a little coffee in it this year. <laughs> right. And I, yeah. but, but I think that's one of the cool things about flavor, too, is that flavor evolves, right? So your comment about that wasabi piece, I did a piece for a local restaurant years ago that was wasabi and candy ginger because they were this nouveau Japanese restaurant and it worked perfectly. But yeah, I, was, I wasn't gonna put that piece on the table at my house on Thanksgiving because it just wouldn't have worked. People would have been right, like- Right, exactly. You know, that's- What are you work. doing? I know, but yeah. what were you thinking? Could you do yeah, peanut what's, butter? What's wrong? <laughs> right. Hey, do you do peanut butter? Do I? Yeah. Yes, of course. You know, the, again, the peanut butter, when I started, I had this European mentality, right? Peanut butter and jelly is not something that I grew up, grew up with. It's not like a comfort food with anything that, you know, like I need ever really great. It was my husband who said, you should come up with the peanut butter and jelly chocolate. And I'm like, okay, fine, let's do it. And, you know, sure enough, as soon as we made it, it was one of the best selling chocolates that we have, peanut butter and jelly. It's, you have to have it. So what's something else in the case? What else, what else, what, what's something else that's really American in your case? Um, that's really American, really American. You know, really American, I don't really know if you can really throw that in there. I, I tell you some of my favorites that I have and then you tell me if they're American or not. But you know, so I've worked a lot with local chefs here too. One of them is a, a French chef and he loves that togarashi spice, you know, that Japanese seven blended spice. So I came up with a passion fruit caramel with a little bit of togarashi on top. So it has some, some heat to it, but not a lot. Right. That one of, that's one of my most favorite chocolates that I have. Not necessarily American, but I, I love it. Cause it, it, you know, again, it's exotic. It's a little bit outside the box. And then, you know what, American, here's one. I have, because you said Kit Kat, I have a chocolate called Crocantine. It, it has these crunchy almond wafers, uh, a little bit of almond paste in it mi mixed with, with uh, milk chocolate. So it has a nice texture and crunch to it when you, when you eat it. I think that's probably the ultimate American chocolate because it's milk chocolate. It is maybe a little bit like inspired by the Kit Kat bar, which is a huge, 
you know, product here and it's delicious. It's a fancy version of it. Am I allowed to ask what chocolate you use? No, it's a huge secret. <laughs> I use, you know, I use three different chocolates. I started with exclusively with Felklin, a Swiss, you know, Felklin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I just love their chocolate. It's, you know, to me, it's, to me, and this is again, you know, I, I can't, when I was a kid, I was always involved in chocolate tastings. When sales rep came to my parents' place, I was always like sneaking chocolate. So I grew up with good quality chocolate. So I wasn't really allowed to ever have a sneakers bar or anything. And neither did I want to because I had chocolates all around me. So when I moved here, the, the Swiss chocolate to me, it, it, it hit the spot. It's as simple as that. I like the 60%, the, the Arriba, the 72%. That's my favorite. So we use that. We also use Valrona chocolate and we use Calibau chocolate. So a oh. mixture of those three. So it wasn't a secret. You were going to, you were just. No, like God, no. What, what's this? I mean, everybody uses the same thing, right? It's not, I don't have any. Ultimately, you know, last, before the pandemic hit us, in, on, remember when we met in. Seattle. Uh, Seattle and then San Francisco too. We were going through quite a volume of chocolate, not, you know, not extensively, but enough to maybe start thinking about making your own chocolate bean Dubai was something, I, I even talked to you about this, I think. It was something that intrigued me so much because I watched Rotten on Netflix, you know, that show about the cocoa industry. And it really, you know, it was a, it was a very eye-opening documentary about how rotten this industry really is. And to me, that was something, if I can start a relationship with, uh, if, you know, and this is my naive, my naive personality talking because I really don't know. I, I never took it to the next step. It was only a thought. If I can start a relationship with a cocoa plantation and, you know, I can pay, the, pay them fair money, but and at the same time, I can come up with my own chocolate that I like. I mean, it's a win-win situation. I... Ultimately, this is my ultimate goal to do something like that where we can we can give back. Yeah, it's tough, right? I mean, anytime yeah. you add another layer of manufacturing and whatever, you know, when you're out of stock on chocolate, you can pick up the phone and order it tomorrow, right? Like in the big yeah. picture, hey, hey, distributor, I need four cases it's of a, yeah. this. And they go... Okay, we'll ship it to you. Yeah. Right. And then, but when it's when you're on the hook for it, it's like, hey, hey, Bella, go make another 200 kilos of chocolate today. You know, when you're supposed to be doing the marketing or doing the sales or doing the production of. Absolutely. I mean, it comes. It comes marbles. with a whole. It comes with a whole new level of like you know of un, unknown territory, right? A whole new set of problems maybe come your way, but I I don't know. It's just. You know, I, I'm a person, I work with gut feelings mostly, honestly, and, and it, I have to say, it, I have rarely have I made wrong choices based off my gut. And this was another thing that felt right. It felt like it, it, it got me excited, you know, and this is when, when I don't feel excited, it, I usually don't bring it to the next level. So it was something that I really, really wanted to do now. But you're right, you know, I'm not at the level to now, you know, volume wise to, 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 to go down that route. But who knows? I mean... Let's give it another couple of years. See where we're then. Yeah, I was in, I was in, um, where was I? I don't know. It was my first trip in a year and a half. I can't remember where I went. I went to Oregon. I was in Oregon last week, two weeks ago. I don't remember. I, in the last couple of weeks, I, I went to Oregon and I was with a, with a chocolate maker called Chomp and they're making their own chocolate. Mm -hmm. That was why I was there. Was, they bought some equipment. And, anyway. Um, and they had a vision about what the chocolate industry needed, right? And there was, there was a piece about that, about the better produce, you know, paying a fair wage and all those things. But also they really see, they see a niche for vegan, which you talked about before. Yeah. And so they have this process for making a, a vegan milk chocolate. I'm oh, sorry, really? A, a vegan M-I-L-K chocolate. They can't call it milk chocolate um, by definition. Definition. But, but, but my, my, my take on it was, they asked me the case, and I'm like, you know, to be honest with you, if you didn't tell me this was not made with milk, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I mean, it, yeah. it, it had some other flavor things that were going on and, because there was some sugar stuff, and, but whatever. Yeah. But them having to get that right every day is a job in itself, right? Oh, for sure. And, yeah. And, 
and I think I think they're going to be successful because they have a good product, and you know, that's at the end of the day, if you don't have a good product, you can't be successful. Well, that might not be true, but it definitely helps. Um, but I couldn't imagine then spending all this time making sure that that product is perfect every day, and then turning around and making great confection. And you know, but fruition on the East Coast does that. Like, God love them for being able to do both, because that's a lot of work, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but and this is where I'm saying, you know, this is where I'm naive because I'm, to be honest, I don't know what's in, but you know, I, we went to Dandelion uh, factory after the show in San Francisco and it's all machines. I mean, you know, you have, you need to have some good people, right? That, that really know, you, uh, you know, that they need to be trained when the bean is roasted and conched at, at the perfect time, right? But ultimately it's not like, it's not like you need a whole lot of uh, physical labor in it, more like eyes on the product, right? And, and again, I might embarrass myself right now because I don't really know anything about the bean to bar process. When no, it comes I mean, to chocolate making, it's more of a hands-on thing, right? You need to have people actually involved to, you know, mold and make an ashes and pipe and stuff. So I, I, don't, I don't know why you couldn't have both. I, you, okay. you need the volume, I, obviously. I'll get the sales guys to call you as soon as we're done about, you know, about putting more <laughs> selling equipment in your plant. I need, I, you need to send me some business first. And, you know, all these people that are watching, <laughs> we need business and then we can make chocolate bean to bar together. I, I think, I, I, I don't think you're being naive about it, but I also think there is that piece about, like, I can, I can make an optional day with really good equipment and I don't have to be, have a person sort of paying attention to that, right? If I've got process and I have right. the right equipment and there's something about chocolate making that, it's that way too, except for you're farther up the supply chain and having to make sure that the raw ingredients that are coming in the door are great raw ingredients. And yeah, yeah. you know, here, here's the real rub. You make a mistake, right? Then the whole batch is gone. The cost, right, the, the cost changes, right? So not only do you now not have chocolate, not only do you throw out $200 worth of beans or $500 worth of beans, you now don't have chocolate to make you the finished product downstream further. And that doesn't mean it's yeah. not doable because it's totally doable. There are people that are doing it, but it, it's just different, right? It's a whole yeah. other level of, of complication. And I think that's what I told you. I wasn't telling you not to do it. I was telling you, just be prepared that there's another learning curve for you. In the I whole, get it. In the process. But, you know, I mean, this is the thing, right? Things happen, can happen in, in whatever industry niche you're in, whether this is making right. chocolate bean to bar. You know, we here in California, we constantly, you know, for the past couple of years, because we have the, the heat waves, we constantly lose our electricity here. And during production, when the, and how, how can you make, like, we, we, and we have deadlines, right? We have to get product out. We, have, we need to have our product frozen, and, and we are affected by that. But we've learned to shift with this. So if the electricity goes out, we have now different, you know, like we are never at a standstill. We, like we figure it out. Right. And I feel like this is this this is where I thrive. I like I like it. I like challenges and I like figuring it out. I don't want the stress of it, obviously. But I'm not a. What I'm really trying to say is I'm not scared of a challenge. I'm right. just, you know, I'm not there yet. But I wouldn't be scared of taking on a challenge. It sounds exciting to me. So hey, so. Creo just hopped on, Creo Chocolates. They're another company that, that makes chocolate and they make confection. So, yeah. you know, when you're ready, go talk to, to the guys up at Creo. Because right. I'm sure they'll help. Hey, okay, so you picked on Snickers bars earlier and you called Kit Kat bars American. But I, this is a question I ask everybody and we're kind of getting close on time, so I don't want to not ask you. So you have to pick an American mass market confection what do you buy you have to you can't say i don't eat those things you have to pick one uh what am i buying what am i buying what am i buying gosh what, it are, you has to steal? Be... what are you going to steal out of your kid's halloween bag you know i am a sour candy girl i i'm gonna definitely take the sour patch oh anything that's sour goes right with me anything that's chocolate can really stay with them all right i'll give you that one that's fine and, that, and ice cream. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't understand a world without ice cream. Like, people that tell me they don't like ice cream, I don't think that they're, like, they're from this planet. Yeah, ice cream's I, like I the agree. the greatest thing ever. Like, if, if chocolate, if I, if I were to decide I didn't want to do chocolate today, like, if somebody came up to me and said, Brian, you cannot touch another pound of chocolate in your life, I'd go make ice cream. 
You know, my, my, my parents had an ice cream parlor and at some point when they were younger, they had a, over a hundred flavors. And my dad was very innovative with his flavors. Like he had the coolest in, you know, it, it's kind of the same with ice cream and chocolate. You wouldn't go outside the box. You know, you would have vanilla and stracciatella and strawberry, but he would have crazy like whiskey and Baileys. And like, you know, it was, it was scandalous almost. So people would come, they literally would travel in the summertime to come and see us. And, you know, I would sell them ice cream. And uh, there was one thing that, yeah, I was, I loved, this was the nicest thing about being a kid. There was always ice cream and my parents. So, you know, anybody who has been to Europe or Austria, you know that we have like a coffee house culture, right? Like an ice cream, you sit down and you get your, your coffee on a silver tray and you get your ice cream in a cup with like decorations coming out and butterflies flying around. You know what I'm trying to say, I'm exaggerating, but it's not like in the US. So when I was little, my parents said, okay, you guys can invent your own ice cream cup. So there was a coupe Isabella and a coupe Stefan for my brother. And they literally gave us one of these glass things. And a, what's a, a, um, what is that called? And like an ice cream? Scoop. A scoop. And we could come up with our own ice cream. And they had it on the menu until the, they just closed. That They sold their business last September. But my coupe was one of the, <laughs> the coupe Stefan and the coupe Isabella was one of the most sold coupes ever because we just like threw everything in it as a kid, you know, like a little bit of this and a little bit of that and oh, sprinkles. Yeah, let's do it. What was in the coupe Isabella? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. It had vanilla, strawberry, stracciatella and chocolate ice cream, heated up strawberries with a little jam in it, uh, whipped cream, strawberry sauce, sprinkles and chocolate sauce. And then a straw in it, so you could suck, you know, all the stuff up when it was melted. It was the best. <laughs> I'm traveling to Europe. I'm going to Austria in two weeks. I'm taking my two girls, the older ones. And uh, they're pretty devastated. You know, I'm too, to be honest, because we weren't able to say goodbye to Dolmen, right, to the original thing before my parents sold it last year. And for me, it was always like, man, I, you know, I want to travel back one more time so I can say goodbye and I can have my kids... Like my, my dad can give my kids ice cream or a cake and remember him by that, right? It was, it was something, it really broke my heart when I cried for days and I, I'm st I still get emotional because it's such a family thing. So we are going home in two weeks and the business is, is closed, but my dad still has the key. So I'm, I'm just excited to go in and like, let's just pretend to have one last time in this business be before it goes into other hands forever, right? I'm going to cry now. Oh, that was the goal. I wanted to end it on a very emotional note. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you one more question. Actually, yeah. one question. Here's your opportunity to plug whatever you want. Plug your website, plug Facebook, plug Instagram, whatever you want to plug. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Dolmen Confections. It's a very complicated word because we have two L's and two N's. Dolmen Confections. Go visit the website. Please follow us on Instagram. It would be so nice to you know, start building our community a little bit more. Uh, Instagram is Dolman Confections. I think it's on Tom Rick's last post, right? Our handle is on there. Uh, you know, we are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Like I said, I'm a little shy when it comes to social media, but I'm getting, I mean, I, I had a good time with you today, Brian. I kind of uh, really enjoyed this. So I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more present and show also behind the scenes a little bit. You know, what, whatever it is that everybody's crying. I didn't want to make you guys cry. <laughs> Bad. Oh. Can you hear it? Yeah. <laughs> I found it. It's it gets my night, heart it's, rate it's, up. It's, it's, it's the theme to Night Rider. <laughs> it gets my heart rate up. This is amazing. I thought I'd bring it back around. I thought I'd, like, I thought I'd end with something happy, like David Hasselhoff. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was not my major guy. It was more the Beverly Hills dudes, okay? Like Brandon and Dylan. Those guys were more up my alley. Yeah, I, mean, I watched Night Rider and watched Night or Two else, so hold on. Oh, he was just up. David was just there. Like he... Oh, I missed him again, but there he is. He's he's tough to see, but there he is. For you. Okay, I'm I'm not that obsessed with him. <laughs> All right. Well, from now on <laughs> You're going to be the Knight Rider fan in my life. In my head, I now associate you. Bella from Dolman's. Oh, my gosh. This is the Knight label Rider. that I'm getting. I have to do something. I can't be labeled for that. That's crazy. We cannot leave it on that note. <laughs> no. She likes Sour Patch Kids and David Hasselhoff. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, sounds good. I hope okay. that the audience will not label me like that. I can be, I don't know, the girl with the accent. Let's put it that way. The girl with the German where, accent. Where, hey, where are you from again? Like how Austria. Did you here? Yeah, I, I know. I was, I was, I was going back. I'm like, are you, are you, are you, are you, did you listen? I haven't paid attention <laughs> at all. Like, I, I, you lost me at David Hasselhoff. So, oh. anyway. hey, Bella, this has been great. Thanks. Hold on. This has been great. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks for having was, me. This was fun. Somebody asked about Dr. Broner's making chocolate, and I think they're a soap company. I don't know if the you have an opinion about it. Dr. Broner's making chocolate. I think they're a soap company. Oh, Dr. Well. Broner, no idea. Neither do I. So, all right. You gotta go make- What are you gonna, what, what, what are you gonna, gonna do you know what I do? This is actually, it, it slowed down for us significantly, and I have been really complaining at home. I've been a little bit like a, a little witch, that all I do is like, be with the kids, go to work, be with the kids, go to work. I'm so over it. So I started a hobby. <laughs> My husband is like, you need a hobby. Guess what I'm doing? I don't know. I'm, I'm sewing now. I, I'm learning how to sew. I need something else in my life other than chocolate and kids. So I literally go <laughs> to Oceanside right at the beach and I'm taking these sewing classes with like 50 to 80 year olds and I'm having a blast with them. It's really nice. The, the problems, just... it's, it's almost like a reality show for me. It's really, it, it takes my, my problems away and I'm entertained. I love it. On that note. On that note, we'll leave it at that. We're going to leave it right there. Bella, this has been great. Thanks to you so much for joining us. Thanks for reaching out and asking to be a part of it. And uh, Thanks for having me. I really appreciate we'll that. We'll see you soon. I've got to be, I, I think at some point I, I've got to come and visit again. Yeah, you let me know. I'm here. You're allowed to come here too. We're back open. <laughs> when you give me a different label, I will visit. I don't want to be known as the nitrata lady. The I'm nitrata gonna lady's comment. I'm going to have, gonna have a kit chocolate bowl made and send you one. Yeah. Sounds good. I really all appreciate right, all, all you people that watched too. This was really fun. So thank you so much for, for listening and for being here and for having fun with us. And now I don't have to say that. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye, Bye Bella. Bye.